How many of you would like to be, just raise your hand, get ready to raise your hand, get ready to this is going to be great. How many of you would like to be disappointed today? Anybody? Okay, strike one. Not going well. How many of you would like to be, when you leave here, depressed? No? Okay. All right. So you're looking for something else today. How many of you would like to be encouraged? Okay, there's a winner. Yay, you're doing, doing better now. How many of you would hope that the pastor would say something that might go to that? Encourage me. Wouldn't it be good if it would be truthful and truth that you recognize and that has something, some effect upon you? Because there's a lot of truths in this world, a lot of things that we say, yeah, that's true, that car's better than that one, that house is better than this, those kinds of things, but we know they don't carry anything, not really. But the truth of God, the truth of what He says is profound in that it, it works us. And if, in fact, when we become Christians, we don't just get out of hell and into heaven one day, but God gets into us, if that's true, then when we read the truth that He has said is true, then He who is the way, the truth, and the life, something happens to us. And it's good. And sometimes when I, when I come here and I have something to say, I'm going to enjoy saying it because it's the truth. And the truth makes me free in the beginning, but also on an ongoing basis. From fear, free from fear, free from the, the anxieties of this world. Maybe you've got a couple. I don't know. But I'm glad you've, you've come today. And it's my hope that as we go through some passages and look at verses today and talk about those things, that you get something on the inside a couple of times at least where you have that, ah, that. I needed that. That thing. Maybe something the Holy Spirit who lives in you will reveal to you is, ah, I hadn't thought, I hadn't been thinking like that. Let's pray to that end. Would you join me in that? Father, here we are, the perfect places for you to dwell. You've seen to it. You've made it happen. You've worked it just right, and you've worked us just right. And we're thankful that you've done this. We expect you to be evident to us today so that what's, what might be words on a page or words on a screen would become word in us the living Word of God in us, alive and evident. We would love that. Everybody said, amen. <clears throat> Two weeks ago, we um, looked at the, the promise of hope. We began three weeks ago with Rich, but two weeks ago, since that's when I talked, um, we said, number one, firstly, that we are in a living hope. And that we said this because the hope that is around us, the hope that offers us, um, say, some kind of truth to believe and then an expectation to draw from that is eclipsed by the truth of God, which then lives in us and then begins to give expectations to us, and that is what hope really is. Not just what's found in the world, not just there. You know that it gets destroyed all the time and we get disappointed all the time with the hope of this world. But the hope that is, who is God, is living, and we have been born again into Him, and He into us. First Peter chapter 1, uh, verse 3, it's not on the screen. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy, He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Boy, are we going to talk about that next week. Secondly, we said that we are then in our inheritance. We're in it. It isn't something we're going to just get one day, though there'll be something to do with that. It's where we are right now in our inheritance, which is having how many things in Christ? Not a trick. Small three-letter word. How many? Yes. We have that now. I know that much in my days contributes to doubt about that. Doesn't look like it's obvious. Doesn't look evident. But nevertheless, when we see the Scriptures, you recognize, oh my gosh, it's actually true. I'm just having a hard time believing it. So we are in our inheritance, which is imperishable, 
unspoiled and fadeless. You can't get your grubby hands on it. Nobody else can get their grubby hands on it. Nothing can change it. It is locked in. 1 Peter chapter 1 says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy, He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. You have that right now as you sit there in Christ. Number three, we said that all that we have is secured by God. Um, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 4 says, This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that's ready to be revealed in the last time. Do you think of yourself and all that you have, every bit of it is shielded by God? That's a good thought. Yeah. You can't get at it. Nobody can get at it. It is kept for you in heaven. And by the way, where are you seated right now in Christ? In heavenly places. That's actually where you are. You're not going to just get, one, get there one day and go, oh, I finally arrived. Oh, you prayed. You'll wake up there and, ah, yes, this is what I felt like it should have been all along and now is. And now I see it. And I'm walking in it. We said, number four, that trials prove our authenticity. I know many of us have been tempted in the past, as have I, to think that trials are pass-fail. Tests is another word. But these, these are not. They are to prove that we're real, the real deal. That what God did in making us sons, sons of His, having now His nature, it's authentic. It's real, you're real, you're authentic. And we, we were joined by um, Allison uh, Brindley on, on video, and she said that when she had her worst trial ever, God proved himself in her and drove out fear and, in the, and, and filled her with love. And it was profound for her. It was for, for us just to hear about it. And the trial proved that she was the real deal. She actually realized how much she believed in that moment when she knew that her husband had been killed. And it hit her, oh my gosh, I believe everything. It's all true. And now I'm going to walk in it in this day. 1 Peter 1 verse 6, In all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief and all kinds of trouble. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. He's not going to say when, you're, when, when he's revealed to you, oh my gosh, you missed out so much. I am so disappointed in you. Not going to happen. He will be proving that you're the real deal because he made you that way. You are a new creation. You do have faith that he's given to you. You do, and he's going to see to it throughout the rest of your days that it's proven to you that, oh my goodness, I do believe. Huh. And then you realize he's really good after all in another way, on another day. And last week we saw from Romans chapter 5 that number one, we have been justified. We saw that justification uh, doesn't mean that God sees us and treats us just as if I'd never sinned, but that God sees us and treats us, having made us, that he sees us as being righteous and having done all things perfectly all the days of our life. He gives us the righteousness of Christ. So he sees us and treats us as if, or because it's true, we've loved God and our neighbor as ourselves all the days of our life. Here, this is yours. You'll need this. That's justification. So we saw that we've been justified. Number two, that we have peace with God. Again, this is in Romans chapter 5, not on the screen, but I'll just reference it. We have peace with God. What we saw last week proved that, well, let me ask it in a question, can you lose peace with God? No, you can't. Can you feel like you've lost peace with God? Yes, you can. <laughs> yeah, and I bet you have. But no deed of yours, no action of yours, no thought of yours, no failure of yours can cause God to say, well, you know what? That whole thing I achieved for you and gave to you as a free gift, peace with me, I'm taking it back. Never happened. Not ever. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. 
He's not taking it back. Number three, we, we said that because God is in us, he is always growing us in the fruit of hope who lives in us and we in him. He's always going to grow us in that. So we read that not only so, but we also glory in our suffering because we know that suffering produces perseverance and perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope doesn't disappoint us, doesn't put us to shame, rather, because God, God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. And Allison shared with us that she was, when this event happened where her husband was taken from her in a moment, and then the evidence of God in her proved that she was the real deal after all, that she wasn't for one moment thinking, well, I have to persevere, I've got to keep going, I've got to make it happen, because you know this is a character-producing moment. So I got to make sure I'm producing character. Never thought it. So what was God doing? All of that. He was producing in her, you're going to get through this. I'm, I'm telling you, you are. I'll show you. I'll show you. I'm going, to make, I'm going to make sure of it. I'm going to tell you and prove it. You're going to get through this better than just get through it. You're going to be a better you. The one I've made you to be. I'm going to prove it to you through this thing. You'll have character because hope in you and you... United with him, it will not disappoint you ever. And I'll see to it. That was last week. Now let me ask you a question. Why have I just reviewed? Well, let me ask you another question. If you've been focused on this review, how do you feel now? How's your thinking? Is it better? So you get here, you're going through the fog, you're going through the rain, and you oh, oh gosh, well, I hope it's good. You get here, you climb through the front, you got a mask, you don't got a mask, you maybe no more hand sanitizer kind of secretly, so, you know, in the few. And then Brian comes up and says, hey, let's do this, and you have that kind of, oh gosh, all right, all right, okay, okay, okay. And you kind of go through the motions, and then Brian starts singing some good lyrics, and it includes you, and you start to... Okay, yeah, that's good, that's good, that's good. And progressively, you've had this, that's good, that's good, that's good. And I'll bet by the review, that's continued. Oh, yeah, I have peace. Oh, yeah, I can't lose it. Oh, yeah, I've been justified. I don't have to seek justification on my own terms. I never have to say to God, did I do it right enough to get justified with you? Am I okay? I'm always okay already. I got okayed, and now I'm okay. Does that make sense? And the reason for that is that what Paul wrote in chapter um, 1 of Romans 2,000 years ago is still true for us. Romans chapter 1, verse 16. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's like he's saying, heck no, because it is the power of God. It's the power of God that brings salvation, soundness making, to everyone who believes, first to the Jew and then to the Gentiles. And it continues to do it. This is not the salvation just that gets you in the door, which is important, but it's the ongoing process of proving to you that you're the real deal. That salvation came to you, happened for you, will never be taken back. You can't lose it. He's not going to give you more of it. But you have the benefit now of the Word of God living in you so that when you see it on the screen or you read it or you hear it or you sing it, <sighs> And power happens to you. And God happens to you. So the good news, if you get nothing else today, maybe this will be it. God really does live in you. You're not just feeling better. You're not just thinking more clearly. God is proving himself to be in you. Is that good? Yeah. That's why we read our Bible. That's why I read my Bible. I would, have, I would have stopped reading my Bible after about two months if I didn't like it. When I, I know I've heard people say, you've got to read your Bible, you've got to, got to, got to, got to, got to, do it, got to do it, got to devote time to be with God. And I went, well, aren't I always with God? I thought there was that whole with thing. And so, but if I didn't actually like the Word, I would not be reading it anymore, I can tell you. I would have given up a long time ago. But I know that when I read the gospel of His grace to us, Oh my gosh. Is there anything better to read? You found anything? No. Thank you for that nope. There isn't anything better because you come alive, so to speak. 
You have this power going on in you. Why is that important? Because God is again proving where he lives. In you. And he shows up with power. And you feel the better for it. And that's a lesson for all of us for always. So, we know that Jesus is for us something of a superhero. Is that okay? Can I use the term? Okay, that's who he is for us. We know this because we're looking back at it now. We're looking back at the cross and the resurrection. My gosh, that means so much to us. Now we have the scriptures that uh, once, his, once he died, then there's, you know, the, there's all the, the, the books of the Bible after that telling us about what that was that happened on that, those three days, the cross, the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus. We get to look back on that. But what if you didn't know any of that? What if you didn't know that, and what if you were told that a superhero was coming to rescue you? What if you were told that? What hopes would you have of that superhero? Would he wear a cape? If you've seen Emperor's New Groove, no, not Emperor's Groove, um, what, what's the one? The Incredibles, and you know no capes. But if you, <laughs> but if you haven't, sorry. Uh, so, you know, what do you wear? Would it be a he? Would it be a she? What would it be? You know, what would, what would you be rescued from by that superhero? <clears throat> and what if your superhero did not do what you hoped your superhero would do? Didn't rescue you. Didn't make the change. Didn't do the thing you thought, boy, that would be the thing. And this is something of the situation we find in Matthew chapter 21 when Jesus, the long talked about, the long overdue, I would say, Messiah, was about to enter the holy city of Jerusalem. Long history of expect, expecting the Messiah. Long one. And, but that's what they, they all know he's coming, but they've known that for a long time. The superhero is on his way. When? Yep, he's on his way. So, in Matthew chapter 21, we'll pick it up there. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there and her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. Verse 4. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. And by the way, that prophet is Zechariah. Verse 5, say to, say to daughter Zion, see your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Verse 6, the disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees, those would be palm fronds from palm trees, and spread them on the road. So there's this major thing going on. Here he comes! Here he comes! And verse 9, the crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed, so both sides of Jesus, and Jesus wasn't one for parades, I don't think. Nevertheless, he's getting the parade. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? Who is this? Or, Who is this? All kinds of ways they asked that question. Who is this? Verse 11, And the crowds answered, Hey, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Here he comes. So here comes hope to the people of Jerusalem, most specifically to the Jews. But they were expecting hope. And here he comes, the king, gentle, and riding on a donkey. The word Hosanna, you'll see it on the screen, means, means this. It could be said this way. Hosanna! Because it means go save. It also means save, I pray, but it's almost a command because it includes the meaning that this one is able, he will do it. Hosanna! 
It isn't Hosanna. It's a little difference. <laughs> Please save. They were saying, this is the one who's going to do it. Here he comes. Here's the guy. But we know that many of the people who were shouting Hosanna later wanted nothing to do with Jesus because he didn't do what they wanted him to do. We know also from the scriptures that some of them, many of them, wanted to overthrow their, their, the, the captivity of, of Rome. Please throw this yoke off us. Give us the land. Give us the kingdom the way it ought to be. Have you ever had that? Do something the way it ought to be. We just had an election. How'd that go for you? We have all these ways of saying, this is not how it ought to be. Well, so did they. And they gave up on that. So their hope left them when their view, their expectation was proven to be wrong. Rather than repent or rethink, which is what the word means, uh, rather than to rethink their expectation and hope, was I wrong? Maybe I was wrong. They no longer followed Jesus. They gave up like that. And they became as entangled in the affairs of this world as ever before, only more disillusioned, more hopeless. And I think that that has happened to us, and it's certainly happened to people that you know, or maybe that you once knew. Something got their hope. Something got at it and took all the air out of it. And they just... I can't, I'm not doing it anymore. And they walked away. However that looked for that person. Or maybe for you. It happened to you. Maybe even in this season, you're thinking, I'm, I, this, I'm not in this anymore. I, I don't, maybe you've had those thoughts. I just, I don't have it. So I want to take a look this morning at thieves of hope. What are some of those things, some of, some of the perceptions we have, the lies we have, that rob us of hope, that reach into us and take it but by giving us fear or disillusionment. He's not who I hoped he would be. He didn't do it, therefore I give up. What are some of those things? And here's the first one. This is a very serious one I want you to know. God is the best Santa Claus ever. How many of you know that God? No? No? This was my theology as a child. God is the best Santa Claus ever. It also continued, this theology of mine continued into my um, young adulthoodness. I, I mean, I held on to this thing for quite a while, and my th theology went something like this. You better watch out. You better not cry. You better not pout. I'm telling you why. Why? Santa Claus is coming to town. What's he doing? He's making a list. He's checking it twice. Going to find out who's naughty or nice. Claus is coming to town. And what is he doing? He sees you when you're sleeping. He knows when you're awake. He knows if you've been bad or good. So, goodness sake. Oh, <laughs> I threw that in there for free. You better watch out. You better not cry. B better not pout. I'm telling you why. Santa Claus is coming to town. How many of you have ever sung that in church? <laughs> it was a good moment, wasn't it? Maybe not that good. This is why, then, we labor, many of us, to give our kids not the gospel of Santa Claus, but the gospel, and not the gospel of behavior. The gospel of you better earn this with God because he's, a, he's kind of creepy. He's watching all the time, you know, measuring you and judging you. But the gospel of life, that is the essence of our gospel. Not that God wants to crimp your life or get it right. And you are his clay after all. And he's going to... But that he's come to give you something. He's come to give our kids something. Free. Something they don't have yet, which is life. Not a roadmap necessarily, or a prescription for how to behave to get him to behave himself with you too. Our theology is effectively this, John 17, 3. Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. What 
This verse, to me, defines the hope we have for our children and the offering we, we give to it. It's where our focus goes with our kids. We want to help you to know this. We want you to have life and then to know this life who will come and live in you way better than Santa. Because I can tell you that the, those of us who held on to the Santa Claus theology, we got beat up. It didn't work out. We thought Santa Claus, who was always watching, who sees what I'm doing, ought to behave better than he did. And that's what happens to a lot of Christians. When they don't get what they thought God was going to give them, what they wanted God to give them, what do they do? Is there another Santa? St. Jesus ain't doing it. Not the best clause. So we want to remind people that what their hope is, is life and one to live in them so that they may know him. That won't ever disappoint them. Secondly, number two, God is man-centered, not Christ-centered. This is not true, by the way. <laughs> I should say that. We think that God is man-centered, not Christ-centered. This breeds what, I'll, what I've called selfie Christianity. You know what selfie Christianity is? You know, you hold your camera up, and you, got, you have to reverse the camera because I, I always fumble with that. You got to reverse the camera so it's not looking out there, but it's looking at me. And then I try to, mm, e, ah, uh, no, that didn't work. Okay, other hand. Oh, I don't like the background. And we do these things where we have to try to line. Some people are really good at it. I'm, I'm eh, marginal. But we try to get it just right. And some people throw in duck lips, which ought to stop. But anyway, we do this thing, and that's how their Christianity goes. How am I looking? Am I doing good? How's it going? And they have themselves and their behavior as a mirror for how God thinks they are. Selfie Christianity. And they begin to think, I've got to do this right because God is man-centered. He's depending his behavior upon mine. If I get it right, if I'm doing it just right, then he will too. And the end of that is ugly and awful. And what we'll find is through our, through our days, you're going to find people who are all into selfie Christianity. I've got to do this because God has hindered or limited himself and how he'll behave toward me based upon my behavior. You're going to meet them. Maybe you have been one. Maybe you are one. But we, they'll think, I've got to do this thing. You don't want to interrupt that too soon, by the way. Have you ever tried? They may think, I'm, look, I'm working hard here to get this right because I've, I've got something I want from God. I want to make sure things are right. And if you jump into that too soon, they're going to just cast you off. So sometimes you want to just let them go because the Spirit may be letting them to abandon finally this fleshly effort to impress God because they're only, they're just, they're starting to get a peek of the impossibility of being self-focused, selfie Christianity, where God begins to tell them or, or, or they can hear him say, it's all free. It's all yours. It's my gift. You're, you've nothing to earn, nothing at all. Because the hope of Christians is that there's nothing demanded of us. All is given, all of it. And so God is Christ-centered. He's not man-centered. He's not looking at you and basing his behavior on that. He's looking at Christ and giving you how many things for free? All things. What if you don't deserve it? All things. What if you have a real bad season? All things are yours. In Christ, that, that is the good news, which is, again, another reason why this morning as we reviewed, your mind started to go, God, that's good news, that's good news, that's good news. This is what we tell people. It's all based on him and not based on you. That's the new covenant. Romans chapter 8 says so, that the mind set on Christ is life and peace. So as you think about him and how good it is with him for you, what happens in your mind? Life and peace. Ah, I get it again. I'm feeling better. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20 says, I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live, 
The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's our truth. We know that God is focused on Christ. That's what he bases his behavior on, the faithfulness and perfection of Jesus, which is a gift to you. He's not man-centered. He is Christ-centered. Number three, an erroneous expectation of God. God is a moody Pharisee. God is moody, and he's a Pharisee, which is worse. So he's, he's looking at you and measuring you, and your behavior is related to the last one. It's like, okay, that's it. I'm, I'm a, I have to distance myself. I mean, I can only hang out with you for so long. That, this, is, this is really too much. You've gone too far. There must be discipline. Somehow I've got to punish you for the way you've been. I am upset with you. You should know about this. So let's do it. Let's do Let's pretend that you get a call from an elder of a local church, one that you're familiar with. Maybe you've been there a time or two in the past, and you get a phone call one Monday morning from an elder of that church, and the elder says, um, have you heard about our church? Well, the truth is you have, and it has gone badly for them. They are, the people that are going there are acting horribly. They're drinking, smoking, lying, stealing, cheating, doping, sexing, doing all kinds of stuff they ought not to be doing, but they're doing it, and they don't seem to have any um, repentant thoughts at all. They're just doing it. This guy calls you and says, have you heard about us? And, well, yeah, the truth is, yes, I have heard about it. Uh, well, there's some other things you haven't heard. And he tells you more things, and it's worse than that behind the scenes. And that elder then finally says to you, okay, here's the deal. We want you to write a letter to the church. We'd like you to write a letter to the church and whatever you put in that letter, we're going to write, we're going to read rather next Sunday in our service. Whatever you want to tell us, in light of what our behavior is, whatever you want to tell us, that's what they'll hear. So here's the question What's in your letter? What would you write? What would you tell those cruddy behaving Corinthians? Badly behaving. What would you say to them? This is essentially what happened to the Apostle Paul. He had helped to, to, to found the church of Corinth. He'd gone off for a time, and then he began to hear how badly behaving they were. Awful. If you've read 1 Corinthians, you know some of the stuff they did, some of which I kind of said <laughs> in my little uh, rambling there. And you knew that their behavior was terrible. So Paul knows, I have got to, I've got to arrest this. I've got to stop it. I've got to do something. So here's what he writes to them. This is not on the screen, but it's 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Here's what he writes to those cruddy behaving Corinthians. Verse 1 in chapter 1. Paul called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and our brother Sosthenes to the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be his holy people together with all those everywhere who call in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. Verse 3, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, that's interesting. Verse 4, I always thank God, always, I always thank God for you because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus. For in him you've been enriched in every way with all kinds of speech and with all kinds of knowledge. Thus, God thus confirming our testimony about Christ among you. Therefore, you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. He will also keep you firm to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful who has called you into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Did you ever get through that and think, wait a minute. You're saying all these really great things. Don't you want to give them kind of a, a whack across their unrepentant backsides and wake them up? Would you in your letter? Why did he not? I think it's because he knew who they had become despite how they were behaving. And because he knew who they had become, he appealed to that. It was foremost in his thinking. Rather than giving them a whack, knock it off. You can't do that. God is going to judge you. He can't bless you if you're going to keep doing that. Stop it. He first says, 
I know who you are. I know what change he's made. You may have forgotten, but I have not. And he tells them. This is our appeal to cruddy behaving Christians. It's not to warn them about God, the moody Pharisee. It's to tell them, to remind them in some way, this is, I know who you are. You may be acting like a, a lunatic, but I think it's temporary. And I'm going to give you the gospel that is the hope that you have because it's the power of God for the waking up, for the saving grace that you must need because your behavior proves it. Does that make sense? And then later, he gets into correcting their behavior. He wrote in 2 Corinthians a second time, knowing that we're probably prone to this. He writes in 2 Corinthians, as surely as God is faithful, our message to you is not yes and no, meaning we faked you out or you got this, but you didn't get that. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, by me and Silas and Timothy, was not yes and no, but in him it's always been yes. For no matter how many promises God has made, they are what in Christ? Yes. For how long? Always. They're yes in Christ. And so through him, the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. In other words, all we do is say, yep, that's right. Amen. All right. That's right. Amen. That's true. That's the truth. It's spoken to us by, uh, to, uh, to the glory of God. Now, it's God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ, you cruddy behaving Corinthians. He anointed us, set his seal of ownership on us, and put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. Remember, Corinthians? It's what he did. You can't put him in a bad mood. You can't do it because he values Christ, and Jesus is in you, and you're in him. He gave it all to you. That's the perfect relationship he gave you. You never need to woo God. You'll never do any, need to do anything right in order to attract him to you. There's no class on successful flirting with God. It's been done, and it's finished. Number four, God is an authority hog. This was what I thought of God for years that he was an authority hog. I didn't want anything to do with Jesus when I was in my uh, late teens, early 20s, because I knew what giving my authority and freedom away meant. I had traveled some of the country on a, um, a school program from uh, the university I attended on the West Coast, USC. They're playing tonight in the NCAAs, for those of you who care. And um, I, I had noticed looking at various countries in which I traveled and lived, that sometimes the governments were huge and people had given their freedom to the government and inevitably it meant a diminished people. So I saw this all over the, all over the globe, came back to America and went, yes, glad to be home in the land of the free because we have the authority. It's vested in us. We might give you a little bit to the government, but you can't have it all because we know we want, we know what losing authority means. We're paying some attention to that right now, I think. However, I had this fear that God wanted the same thing, that he wanted my authority. I had no rights, had to surrender all of my rights and then be in an ever-continuous state of sur surrendering more of my rights because, you know, they're bad. But what I found was that God always exercises his authority for my freedom without exception. When I finally said yes to him, because darn it, I believed in him, okay, you can have my authority. He never asked for me it again. He never said, no, you, you took a little back. He's never said it. Because he exercises his authority for my freedom to see to it. Ralph, I'm going to make sure you're free. I'm going to make sure that at all times from everything, you are free. And should you lose some of that freedom, I'm going to work to give it back to you because that is how I am, and this is how you are. You are free. I am not an authority hog, and that you lose if you get it, give it to me. It is the great contradiction of this world. If you give your authority to a, to a workplace, to a boss, to a government, you lose. But if you give yourself all to God, you benefit completely.
because he exercises his authority to keep you free. Galatians chapter 5 verse 1 says this, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Isn't that an interesting phrase, that sentence? He twice mentions it. This, this, word, this word freedom means this. It is for lack of restraint, without restraint, that God has made you without restraint. He still thinks it's true. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. That yoke of slavery that was threatening them is you better do something or God won't. You better earn what you could have lost, Galatians. I know God says he's given you everything, but what if you've lost some of it? You better get it back. And that means surrendering to him, giving up, stopping all kinds of things. Give your authority to God because he wants it all. Not true. Not at all. He's in you. Keep you free. That's the ministry of the Spirit. It's for freedom in you. Father, thank you for how you are with us and how you are in convincing us that we have a living hope and that hope lives in us and that we need not fear. Thank you for showing us ways that we are ripped off or that hope is taken from us. Thank you for showing that to us. It's not true. It'll never happen. And we would ask too that you'd keep showing us where it is that our hope has been threatened or perhaps taken from us so we could have it all back. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.